My name is Shivani and I'm currently a third year medic at Barts in the London and today I'm joined by four incredibly knowledgeable and experienced individuals. So the um, first person is Dr. Dipesh Gopal who is a research fellow and GP based in London. Uh, we also have Kayodi Oki who is a medical student at Dundee. Uh, we have uh, Christina Plowman who is a medical student at UCL and Khadija Megwawi, who is a medical student at Bristol. And they've all had extensive experience working in decolonization medicine. And we're very, very excited to hear what you have to say. And we will also take any question at the end, so feel free to put them in. And um, if there's time, we'll definitely consider them. So um, I want to start off the panel by actually talking about what decolonization is because it's a concept that's been around for quite some time, but it's incredibly relevant today. So what does decolonizing mean to you and why is it so important? Um, who wants to go first? Um, should I go first? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, I would say decolonization is about um, disrupting the current power balances. So, um, this cis heteronormative patriarchy that in which we live in it's kind of like questioning who holds the power who holds the knowledge like what is even classed as knowledge um so i'd say decolonizing is kind of like just uh an up yours to society and what Hi what, 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 what the um, current practices are um do we know roughly when this is going to get started i don't know if anyone's chairing the panel hi uh <laughs> Hi, hi, Christina, can you hear me? Hello? I don't think she can hear. Oh no, okay. Let me message her. <laughs> Just a minute. Um, I think that's all I had to say anyway. Um, just, I guess, questioning what is class and knowledge and who owns the knowledge um, I'll pass on to someone else. Catch the metaphorical ball. <laughs> Hi, um, apologies, my audio cut. Would someone I... be able to repeat the question? Um, I can't hear you now, Depesh. Vani, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, Asia, the question was, um, what is decolonizing and why is it so important in the medical curriculum? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say that I think there seems to be uh, an idea that medicine occurs in a vacuum, and especially like medical oh, research is. Hoping... Oh, oh, sorry, where are you going? Oh, sorry. Um, that medicine and med med medical research occurs in a vacuum, so it's like pure and it's, it's free from outside influence. Um, so if, if we look at like social sciences, p politics, art, we know that definitely does affect, affect medicine and the way, the directions that it does go. I mean, um, and if, if you look at like psychiatry during like the civil rights protests in America, um, you know, people that are protesting were taken off the streets um, and, you know, labeled with psychiatric disorders, which, you know, is completely an insane thing to do. Um, and so medicine had like a, a, a way in like sectioning these people. Um, and so the, the other thing is also that research is free from bias. And as soon as something is research, some people feel that it's pure. Um, and, you know, it's, it's conducted by humans who come in with their own gaze. Nothing is free from bias. When everyone says it's unbiased opinion, it's just, that's not a thing. Um, and so decolonization is sort of looking at one of it one of the, the aspects is looking at the way history so colonization and we are all products of that colonization um and and globalization as a concept but that has changed the way that medicine is going and it's not always benefiting everyone in society so it's about challenging power like o oki said but it's also about like, looking at medicine in a completely different way um, and when you challenge, we'll go into the experiences, but when you challenge people, they get, they get upset when that happens. And so um, that's our role, basically. Did 
Tina, can you hear us now? We can see you now. I'm really sorry about that. I'm sorry if I interrupted anyone. Oh, no, don't worry. Don't worry. I, um, don't, so I don't forgive you, Christina, at all. I'm still um, <laughs> seething. <laughs> so we were just talking about um, like what decolonizing is just to give like the audience an understanding of it. So is there a way that um, you would define decolonization? Um, I think it's what's quite interesting with decolonizing is that um, in its original usage, it was used for uh, kind of repatriation of like indigenous lands to the mm -hmm. indigenous people who have been colonized. So we do have to be quite sensitive with how we're using this. Oh, you can't hear. Can you? It's just a bit quiet. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll try and speak. It's okay. Can people from the chat, can you yeah. know? I think it's the students who can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Annabelle, Maria, Favrisha. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> I will start again. I'm sorry if I'm wasting everyone's time. Um, so it relies on the understanding um, of the historical impact of colonialism. So in its original form, it was about like repatriating indigenous land um, to people. And we have to be careful about misappropriating that. So in the decolonizing the university movement, it's more about decolonization of knowledge. Um, it's just a method of deconstructing kind of complex and big social issues that are present in medicine and society. Um, like how uh, institutional racism can lead to like differential health outcomes that have been shown in like many different areas like obstetrics like um, COVID-19, um, but also it gives an insight on how to deal with this in like both a personal and professional way. So like shifting an emphasis from kind of just pure biomedicine to like medical pluralism. So including different kind of health narratives and models of health needs, uh, like cultural safety, critical consciousness, um, things like that. Um, but actually you can apply decolonization to so many different things like arts and literature, sport even like, it's just, it's a very useful tool and powerful tool of analysis. Shall I go on or did anyone want to add anything? <laughs> no? Giovanni is trying to say something, but we can't hear her. Um, we, we can't hear her. Can you hear me now? Okay, I'm so sorry, so many audio issues today. Um, I just wanted to say that's really interesting to see like the different viewpoints, like uh, especially like medical plural pluralism, like different narratives. And um, I wanted to ask you all, how do you think we can kind of incorporate this into like the medical uh, the medical curriculum? I know that many of you have worked as part of that. So, um, how have you been able Hi, to so try and incorporate? A... Oh, sorry, I thought I had a lag, but I don't. Hi, Khadija. Hi. Um, would I be able to answer the first question? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, is is someone getting a lag, like a, an echo? No. Um. Okay, I'll keep talking. I'm so sorry. Um, I think that with decolonization, it has to be reframed as a matter of patient safety. So um, often we kind of view this issue as sort of like theoretical um, or um, something that you know serves our interests in terms of becoming more cultured um, as doctors, which is important. But when you, the curriculum needs to be made us to be able to practice on the whole population that we serve in this country um, and internationally as well um, and that population is not just um, you know white male middle class it is everyone um, and if we start reframe reframing this narrative as needing our curriculum to enable us to become safe and effective practitioners for the entire population then the then the question becomes far more important and there is a need 
um, the safety and efficacy as future doctors to prioritise this conversation. Thank you, Khadija. It's really important because taking into consideration decolonising, like it directly affects patients' outcomes if you're not mindful of all of these issues. And that's very true. Um, so I know that um, you've all worked as part of like decolonising um, the curriculum, not only in universities, but also student groups, um, and also in healthcare as well. So does anyone want to share like what what they do and how they've gone about it and maybe what challenges you faced along the way did you want to go for that one because we haven't heard a lot from yeah sure um so something i did at, um i, I well um, i co-led the formation of the bame msg at bristol medical school so the bame medical students group um and i did this after um coming to the bma um medical students conference and proposing a rider in policy which said that um, we had to have um, BAME working groups at medical schools to input into future program planning. Um, so then I went and co-led the formation of this group at Bristol um, and this was about a year and a half ago so um, what was very interesting to see was that it, things moved a lot more slowly than they did now um, which I suspect is because it's you know the recent movement has made it um, a lot more focused and it's not that I criticize it as you know people jumping on the bandwagon of a trend because it's always good to get more support when it comes but I do as I say like I, I, I sort of as a problem when as I've said previously it's a matter of patient safety um, but anyway um, we formed this group um, it this group was kind of like the ethos of it was moving the conversation from discussion to action so I sometimes find that a lot of meetings um, around this topic for the last, you know, few years before this, at Bristol anyway, before this group was taken up, were framed around, you know, the theory, um, the, um, like, what does it mean um, and why is it important? But for me, it was very important to emphasise that we should already be on the same page now. We know it's important um, and we need to move the conversation around what is actually going to happen on the ground to make this change. So we developed a, a set of aims, very specific. Um, so, you know, things like, and very tangible. So things like changing images, but not just changing images, um, ensuring that de decolonization and diversity and racial representation. So even using the word race as well is integrated throughout the medicine itself. So it's not just an issue on diversity day, it's an issue throughout your medicine. So things like um, we said about like when you're teaching about diseases, teaching about um, the uh, prevalence of certain diseases such as sickle cell anemia in that are more prevalent in other um, ethnic groups. Um, it's things like ensuring your cultural competency um, is assessed in all. We did an event where um, we had an ear examination and it was like perform this ear exam on a hijab wearing patient. So um, it's that, like, as you can see, you're testing the medicine, but you're also testing your ability to be culturally competent as a doctor. Um, so we did all of this. Um, um, I also ran a medicine event, which got um, over 80 people um, attending. Um, and it was because we were, we're working to kind of like integrate these things like throughout the curriculum. Um, but with this event, it was kind of like a stopgap in terms of people who just ensuring that they're kind of equipped that they've at least been exposed to these concepts before so we explored how even a lot of like not being exposed to these concepts can actually endanger patients things like um uh, that studies showed that women um with who are dealing with domestic violence often need evidence um from their doctors about like the kind of like physical bruises and things that they've had um not saying of course that all cases need physical bruises but it's part of the evidence um, and a lot of doctors were unable to identify these on patients with darker skin which meant that these women faced obstacles in terms of um, submitting evidence of the abuse that they would faced so it's things like that that are directly impactful and we explored all of these in the session from things such as dermatology to prevalence of diseases to all the other issues I've mentioned and um, we had uh, Malone McCondy speak who's just incredible author of Mind the Gap um, and uh, yeah it, 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 the feedback was just you know that it's just 
how have we not been exposed to this before? Um, so yeah, this was a, our work was kind of like, again, direct action. Um, and then since then I've gone back to the BMA and myself and another rep um, from another medical school have now created a national um, BAME working group across medical schools for students to come together um, and ensure that this work um, is that, that we share best practice, create a document of best practice on how to kind of like increase the racial representation in your curriculum. Um, and we're going to hopefully like co-produce a document with the BMA about it to ensure that BAME students are being protected for their time in terms of like how they're inputting into program planning and to put the emphasis on staff to decolonize their curriculums rather than the students to do it for them. Um, sorry, I'll, 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 I've spoken for a while, but uh, thank you. No, that's, that's absolutely amazing, Khadija, the amount of work that you're doing in this field. Okay, I want to hear your story again. It's it's too good. Over it. I think you're on mute. <laughs> um. Yeah. So, I think in terms of like work to do decolonizing, um, I will start with a different story that Depeche hasn't heard. Um. So I I do kind of remember. During my final year of my last degree, I did um, my my final year was on international health, and I remember we we each had to like write an essay on a topic of international health that we um, wanted to do. And one of my course mates, um, I'm not going to say her name because for confidentiality reasons, um, she uh, she was a bit of a that's what I'm looking for. She she does she didn't really mind rocking the boat um, too much, and she decided to write um, her essay on First Nation people in Canada and things because she felt that was an area of the curriculum, an area of just living in the world that isn't really touched on like Canada is always looked at like it's this wonderful beautiful utopia place oh Canada is so lovely and I read her essay and I thought it was really 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 empowering and um because I didn't really this, this sounds really really stupid but until then I it hadn't really occurred to me that First Nation people some people call them Native American people exist in Canada I just thought it was like it was sort of like an American um problem rather than a North American problem about lots of people being displaced. But in her essay feedback, she got really troubling feedback from our lecturer because in the essay, she cited um, stories from people who were First Nation um, individuals who had um, been through all the atrocities. And the feedback she got was, how do you know this is true? This is just people saying this. And I would say that was probably like my first proper experience with the idea of decolonizing medicine and, de and like thinking about who owns the knowledge. Um, after that, I've become more involved in doing stuff specifically with the curriculum. So I currently sit on my medical school's race working group and that itself has a lot of problems. Um, I'll hand over to someone else to talk a bit more because I feel like I've spoken for a wee bit and I'd like this to be a bit of a conversation so I'm not just like giving a long speech for a really long time. Um, so over to you, Tina. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Aki. Um, I, I think it's very interesting, the example that you mentioned about um, Indigenous people because that is something that we don't have in the UK unlike America, Canada, uh, Australia and New Zealand and a lot of what inspired me actually was a uh, model of cultural safety linking to what Khadija was saying about patient safety mm -hmm. that was co-developed by healthcare professionals and um, Maori people in uh, New Zealand so as an example of like co-produced knowledge which is kind of quite startling um, compared to what the kind of traditional like biomedical ways of producing knowledge um, so just to make a little link there in terms of what we're doing at our university um, we I think the, the the big thing that I should mention um, is that we did a round table event where we had eight medical students presenting um, about what they were doing at their universities 
And just to emphasize that we're not all working under one banner. We have very different um, approaches and because each medical school is different, we're all at different stages. Um, it was just really amazing to hear the different work that was being done across the country. And um, that like decolonizing is just one uh, way of talking about this, but actually lots of different groups share similar ideals. But it's such the problems that we're talking about, things like racism, things like social inequalities, everything, health inequalities, there's such big topics and there isn't a simple answer. It's a very important to have diversity of thought. Um, so I will pass on to Depeche just to keep things going, keep the conversation going. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Yeah. finally. Yeah. I'm lost. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, so right. sorry, everyone. No, it's fine. Um, what was I saying? So yeah, experience of 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 decolonizing, of decolonization of, of medicine. So I think I read I read an interesting book, which I think probably many people have read, um, by Angela Saini called Superior, which looks at sort of race and rise of, of race science. Um, and differences between, between the races. And one of the things she highlighted was um, the blood pressure guidelines. So the blood pressure guidelines, you know, for Afro, anyone who, who ascribes to Afro-Caribbean um, descent, then they get a different blood pressure medication because they are inherently genetically or biologically different. Um, but when you looked at some of the meta-analysis data, it just didn't make any sense. There was no significant difference in blood pressure response. Um, and so I wrote, I think I, I saw something online and then I wrote something with one of the cardiologists. Um, and we, you know, we, we took it, took it apart basically and said that, you know, there's so many reasons why it's wrong because, you know, a lot of us could have African or Caribbean um, ancestry. No one can predict whether that is. Um, and, you know, people who look, who, who look white or Asian or whatever ancestry you might think someone is, they may very well have that ancestry so you can't really rule it out and all these factors um and put it online and um got sort of a hailstorm of um i wouldn't say abuse but challenges from uh the question which was very interesting um and so i mean there's one consultant dermatologist who i'm not going to name obviously but um sort of just did sort of take me take take me to task basically on it and said um um I'm I'm not a hypertension expert, so I'm not going to debate the guidelines specifically. But um, after citing the national guidelines and imply they are at best discriminatory, discriminatory or at worst racist, is a very very dangerous accusation, um, even though it's scientifically rigorous. So if, if there's no evidence, then why are we doing it? Is the, is the question. So when you challenge people on the on the evidence, that people get 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 upset and angry and sort of just say you're not allowed to do this, and it's like why not? It's not benefiting patients, not benefiting anyone. So we shouldn't be doing that and we shouldn't be doing things that are harming patients. So essentially we are denying anyone who ascribes to Africa or Caribbean ancestry ACE inhibitors, which we know are very good. They're very good at um, 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 protection, protection in diabetes, blood pressure, they're kidney protective, so they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. And same, same thing you can say with lots of biological markers, which are just based on very small sample size. Can I just yeah. like oops. go on, Khadija? I was just going to quickly say on that 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 literally ties to the whole issue we've spoken about before that um, the idea of patient safety and that actually we have to really, in order to the other issue around decolonization is we have to start very openly teaching the own race, our own sort of like racist legacy and colonial legacy of a lot of our medical knowledge. So unfortunately. For most of um, the practices of medicine in the West anyway, um, there's a whole other conversation about how actually a lot of medicine develops in the global South and the East, which we don't really talk about. But anyway, the medicine that developed in the West was often, as with most advancement in the West, at the expense of people of colour around the world, at the expense of colonialism. And in the West, for most of its advancement, um, people of colour were not considered to be important as patients. They were not considered to be part of the population that were worth you know, saving um, or furthering the health of. They were just instruments in order to advance the science and the medicine for those at the top who at the time were white people. So that's the issue that we have here. And the problem is because research is slow and also people don't really think about it much or don't want to really own up to it, 
a lot of the research and medicine we have to this day builds on that colonial legacy um, and uh, on both the legacy of colonialism and the legacy of slavery. So when you're building on knowledge formed, you know, hundreds of years ago, based on that, you just build and build and build, and you are not looking back and questioning your own history. Um, that means that, that stuff like this, that, you know, uh, Depeche talked about today is happening. And I think the issue that we're having is a lot of the time medicine focuses on the science and not on the history of it or, and doesn't analyze its own um, subjectivity. It presents itself as objective science, right? Um, you know, even in medicine, when you do like history of medicine or arts of medicine, it's kind of seen as an extra, it's not important. Um, but the problem is we do have to start analyzing our own history to look at the flaws in these concept, in concepts, because once you identify the flaws and you just turn around and say, no, 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 this research was done incorrectly, was done in an exploited manner, you can then more positively go, okay, we've identified that issue. Now we can actively work to tackle this. We can actively um, get people of color into research, um, get um, you know, uh, participants who are co-researchers with you. It's not exploitative. You are empowering them through this and you are addressing the gap that exists to then develop better, much more competent practice. Like I, I was just going to like just add to what, well, kind of sort of counter what Depeche was saying because I, I do think it does benefit people to follow um, the guidelines and everything. Um, it benefits cis, hetero, white patriarchy. It, it benefits like that entire system. Um, people are not willing to relinquish that power because they believe if other people have power, that means they're losing something so I, I i that is why people including that dermatologist they're quite triggered by um by the article you wrote in the conversation um because they don't want to relinquish that power like you as an asian man you have come to threaten the white patriarchy so why should they be happy with that that is a massive threat to them that is them losing their power so i think um when I think about decolonization, I always, I prefer to think about it as even more than um, changing the medical curriculum. Because at, cause even, even when we change the medical curriculum, it is on the terms of the cis heteropatriarchy. Like these changes are only allowed to happen because they've said it. So unsurprisingly, um, Khadija's work had a lot of progress because of recent events in the media. Prior to that, she wasn't getting any um, attention or anything, but because her medical school wanted to be seen to be doing something positive, they're like, yeah, I don't want to say, but they did jump, they, they are jumping on the bandwagon. So I, I think even when they are letting, let us, yeah, even when they are letting us do things, we need to keep on pushing and ensuring that that sometimes actually students, we're the, we're, we're the people who know more about some situations. So I'll come to a story later on in the conversation, maybe, hopefully. And But um, I had a group called Seizing Your Curriculum with my medical school. And in, within that group was a student who is literally a trained anthropologist who has been out there doing field work, but she still wasn't taken seriously because she was a student and the cis heads patriarchy and white supremacy was were, were up there of the medical school were up there saying oh we know more and we know better but actually she was a specialist she's done this for many years but that's all i have to say on that i think oh sorry you go <laughs> Classic. Um, I was just going to quickly very like respond to that and say it's that's why it's about pushing beyond what the trend says and what has now deemed been deemed acceptable. So I've even noticed this now in like a lot of the actions I propose. Um, it'll be things like okay, like now people have said we need to have some diverse images, so we're doing that. Um, but there's still kind of resistance when you try and move beyond that and say okay, um, can we um, you know like. I mean, I, certain, certain requests I won't necessarily name just because we're still in discussions about them. But when you try and like sort of push beyond um, what has been allowed or like or is the trend, that's when the pushback happens or when you try and address issues that aren't necessarily being spoken about. Um, 
that can happen to you. So I just want to like tell healthcare professionals, medical students here, um, just don't be afraid to keep asking and keep pushing and like, and, and also ensure that you're being compensated for your time when you do that. Because as I've said before, um, it's the staff's job to act on what like you as students feel you need. Um, and that's why like we're creating as a nas national Bay medical schools group, we're trying to create this document of best guidance to show you how to protect your time um, and how to form effectively as a group in your school so that you can then make progress on this. But yeah, entirely, um, she echo what you were saying that it's a, like a lot of it is to do with the trend which is good but it can sometimes mean that you are stopped there so don't be afraid to go beyond that yeah <clears throat> is my sound working yep okay, good. um so i definitely think there are a couple of points in here that are like really important to um look at so one is this kind of hierarchy of knowledge that we have um that is within um biomedicine or as Khadija was talking about like what's traditionally seen as like western medicine and these hierarchies of knowledge so you might have seen like these kind of pyramids where you have like a randomized uh, a systematic review of randomized controlled trials at the top and anecdotal evidence right at the bottom and kind of non-biomedical models are completely excluded from that so when we start to learn medicine we sort of kind of are enculturated into this knowledge system and we have to be very aware that and, and be critical of this which is something that the medical school don't really teach you because you are given these facts about uh, blood pressure uh, guidelines for instance or about um let's say like in renal medicine like estimated glomerular filtration, filtration, filtration <laughs> rate, for example um, and you're not taught to question this at all um, because these are facts and they are black box and they are removed from the knowledge system from which like produce them in some ways like with infectious diseases if it's a simple bacterial infection you have a guideline about the right antibiotic that is kind of more simple and that seems to work but what about non-communicable diseases what about like mental health conditions and things like that these are like big complex multifactorial things where medicine actually plays quite a small part in the like the overall health of that person and their lived experience so doctors sit in between these two um like we sit between like the kind of the medical knowledge and also the patients and other healthcare professionals of course like nurses physios everyone like that um and to reconcile this really takes to, to take time to be reflexive to be critical of the system and to be active in what you're doing rather than kind of passive and reactive to these guidelines that you could you could blindly follow um, there are lots of different examples of this like in a recent lancet paper and a new england journal of medicine paper they analyze kind of race-based medicines and race-based clinical algorithms um, that i'm happy to link um, for you to take a look at um, of these examples where you just propagate these like these kind of taken for granted assumptions about um yeah the sort of thing that we can change um, um sorry you go ahead and just like to add to what you were saying about like evidence and stuff just a oh, quick um sense. poll here oh am i muted oh can no, you hear it's me okay i muted you don't worry oh, okay yeah um but what what you were saying, Tina, about like levels of evidence and stuff, like just a quick poll, how many of us have had to do more than two surveys to do with like race recently? Just be yeah. Yeah. And like I've got like really, really serious survey fatigue. So um whilst I've been sitting on my university's um race working group they're wanting to send out a survey to BAME students and I've just been a bit like but why for example the BMA has literally released a long report about the issues um non-white student face at university at, at, at medical school but people are refusing to use that information I'm literally sitting here as a black student telling you what these things are but you're not using that information but you want to do yet another survey because I don't know, you want to do some sort of stats analysis. That doesn't really mean anything. So I, I think that that was a really, really interesting point on um, 
like levels of knowledge and levels of um, evidence and stuff. Yeah, um, I entirely agree with that. I think sometimes in a way, um, people would rather resurvey and re-find out what we already know because they want to distract or not even deliberately, but they, they want to not focus on the action. I'm always saying move from discussion to action because um, so many conversations around this just get lost in further further conversation instead of moving towards okay we are now have we have a general consensus what can we do and this is why um, I believe in things like um, at the end of every discussion with BAME students you should be showing some commitment to what you're going to do next because you need to compensate students for their emotional fatigue of having to re um, you know explain these issues again um, and that isn't fair to students to continuously ask them for that input without showing the progress. So, for example, something that, that really meant a lot to me, actually, was um, I, my medical school have now set up a um, medical anti-racism task force. Um, and as a Bay Medical Students Group, we'd previously had a meeting um, with the head of our um, like uh, effective consulting actors. So we have like in medical schools actors um, who go through, you know, like consulting techniques with us, breaking bad news, all of that. Um, and we the data was shown to us we were like um basically um the demographics are extremely white it literally the statistics were shown like literally 99 percent of them are white and we were just sort of like hmm this isn't right like the, obviously this is this isn't good at all um and then months and this was sort of like pre-covid but then it was for, everything got put on hold then the trend came up so then months later i came to this new task force meeting and the same person represented the data and i was just ready to see no progress but then actually they detailed we have now devised a recruitment strategy and we're now recruiting more actors of people of color um, and stuff like that and presented that and it just meant so much to me like to see that our feedback had been taken on board and actually actioned but that rarely happens like most of the time it tends to just be representing the problem and getting more feedback on the same problem again um and then the other thing i just wanted to touch on um is also this expectation that like BAME students have all the answers just because it's about race. For example, um, you know, just because, um, you know, I'm a person of colour doesn't mean that I'm an expert on race. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I know a lot about it through my own reading and work in this as like a chair of the BME network at Bristol, but I'm still not an expert. Um, and what's even more worrying, but at least with me, like I volunteer my time to be asked about this. I set up the BAME Medical Students Group, et cetera. Um, but what was really troubling is that often in tutorials, when the question of racism and race is brought up, everyone just looks at the person of colour to answer, um, which is just, you know, an unfair stress and burden on a student just trying to learn. And that's why one of the actions we've done is like the Bay Medical Students Group is we've in said, OK, we would like in our effective consulting, just as you teach how to break bad news, um, you know, how to deal with a difficult patient, we would like to be taught how to deal with a racist patient. We'd like to be taught, you know, that question, what do you do if a patient refuses to treat you just because you're not white, um, so to be treated by you. And in that session, we wouldn't, like, we don't want that just to be a free for all discussion because then what will happen quite naturally is like everyone sort of looks at the person of color. We want it to be taught by a facilitator in the same way that all the other things are taught and, you know, some guidance and guidelines and like a mark scheme to be produced to say, this is how you do it. Um, so the pressure isn't on the person, the student of colour anymore, um, because just like with discussions around breaking bad news, we can all maybe come up with suggestions about how to do it. But then there is a framework. There's a taught framework. Discussions about racism and being an anti-racist bystander need to be treated with the same level of importance. And that needs to be reflected in your mark schemes, in your assessment criteria. Um, so that's one of the things we've insisted on as well. Yeah, I completely agree. And thank you so much for everyone who's been posting resources in the comments. Um, the audience are, are very grateful for it. And we have got some questions. That actually brings me on to my next question about, like, um, I think most of the people here are aspiring students or current medical students. And it's just like, what can they do to bring all of this, like, research or stats like, to action? So what, what can they do to learn more about decolonization? What can they do more to like spread awareness, like other resources um, are you guys aware of? Um, do you want to go, Dipesh? 
I was going to say, like, I thought, I thought Tina has all the answers with, with that amazing group. <laughs> um, well, the first thing is, is that it's brilliant that you guys are here and you're showing up to a conference on a Saturday morning. I think that's really, really impressive that aspiring medical students are engaging with this kind of thing. Um, and ask, have, you know, asking questions to us, that, that's brilliant. Um, we have a Facebook group and a reading list, and that is full of resources um, which range from kind of academic articles to podcasts, books, films, uh, documentaries um, that I have shared, but I will share again. Um, but I think the most important thing is to be curious and to be open, um, to read more about it, be open to different points of view. And I think it's like a big part of that is to be, um, like, have something to do in knowing that you do not know everything, probably none of us the person that you're talking to, but that you're willing to learn and you're willing to learn from that other person, even if you don't completely agree with them, um, but have some sort of constructive conversation. Um, because people, no matter like what, what their backgrounds are, or what to it, what's really good is to cultivate an environment of like understanding and understanding where they're coming from. Um, so that's what I would do at this level, um, at your stage. So do some reading, get involved in a conversation, have some constructive disagreements, um, because sometimes you learn a lot more from people who disagree with you than kind of being in the same environment where everyone uh, seems to agree with each other. Mm -hmm. I'll pass uh, Dipash, you go ahead. No, I was going to say, absolutely. I mean, I think the most important thing is you don't need to really win debates and things like that. I think completely what, what Tina said, I think you you get polarization and you have that in political discourse and economic discourse where you just have two poles and they just disagree with each other the whole time, but they're not really willing to see the other person's point of view. They just shut them down or you say something and it it triggers the other person and they shut you down. Um, like you're not allowed to say that. And what, what really is important is you just have to be, you, you have to, I think, if, it, if, if something annoys you, if you hear something from the other point of view, ask yourself why, go deeper, and then go deeper, why of the why? Why does it annoy you? Is it because you have a bias against these people because that's the way you've been taught? And that's true, you might do, and we, no one's perfect, um, but that's not really the point. It's just, it's examine, once you examine and do the deep work on yourself, it becomes easier to examine the situation. Um, you, you'll sort of get three groups of people, there'll be, one group of people which you'll try and have a conversation with you completely disagree with and they don't want to hear anything. Anything you say will double down their point of view. You can't change that group. <laughs> then you have people who definitely agree with on the other side and they will agree with you because you share the same point of view. These aren't the people to change. It's the ones in the middle. <laughs> that's how you get change. And so that's what we're hoping that people are open to having having that point of view and wanting to challenge their own, own belief system. Yeah, and yeah. just okay. just to like add to that, um, um, what Tina and Depeche were saying, I think, um, two things. First thing in relation to what Depeche was saying, um, my form tutor back in secondary school many, 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 many years ago, um, told me. That you should that that should never underestimate the power of arguments. He's a massive Tory, by the way, and um, <laughs> and he 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 told me like, whatever you do, just make sure you always have your say. Like, even if the person is saying they don't agree with you, but if they have like, and they're just completely arguing with you, just say what you need to say and leave. But if they have like a brain cell what you've said would have had some sort of impact on them. So don't, obviously don't put yourself in dangerous situations and say, hey, you racist person, I'm going to argue with you right now. But if if it does come up, just say the way you see things and you might be changed and that person might be changed. And then in relation to like Tina's points about like reading. So I, earlier I posted a TED talk about the danger of a single story. And I think that is so important. So. I always say consume as much media from a variety of different sources as you can. So I'm a black Nigerian, but I love musical theater, but also watch Nollywood movies. I love Bollywood movies. I used to even do Bollywood dancing. Like just like consume 
media from lots of different places. Um, one of my favorite things that the, co the Decolonizing Med group did was we had, they had like um, two sessions based on a TV series called Post, Post, Pose. And um, we were just talking about like um, the different issues that trans people face. So obviously we talked about it in a more academic um, context, but just watching the TV show on Netflix is amazing. Um, Depeche, if you if you search hard enough on YouTube, you'll see it. I went viral in Pakistan, just saying. Um, <laughs> that's it. Over to you, Khadija. Well, it's hard to follow that one up, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to say now? <laughs> um, but no, I entirely echo what everyone's just said. Um, I honestly, massive props to Tina and the Depol group on Facebook. Check them out because they've got some amazing medicine-specific resources to educate yourself. Um, I think, but I also think obviously educate yourself and read, but don't put this pressure on yourself to think I have to become an expert in this before I can do something. You really don't like, obviously read as much as you can, but of course everyone's limited with their time. So I feel that now, hopefully most people, and even by showing up here, you're on the same page. You believe racism is wrong. You believe that people of color deserve representation, um, in medicine. Once you've got those two things in your head, that is enough to start um, acting whilst educating yourself. So I want to reiterate it's things like I believe very strongly in getting involved in like trade union groups. So um, I recommend the BMA like I'm involved in that. I dropped an article about the great work they've done in terms of like the racial harassment charter and putting that on the agenda of medical schools before the trend. Um, the advantage to getting involved in a trade union or some sort of like activist group is that you can then mobilize and work with people nationally. Um, and who will help you remember that this is something that everyone is talking about and you have a weight of a group behind you to support you. Um, and of course, hold that group accountable too. Like, don't just blindly follow, be like, no, you need to put race on the agenda, keep mentioning it. But when you have a group behind you, um, it gives you more of us, more power and numbers as well. Um, and can also like empower you and give back to your time for getting involved. Um, and I also think as well, just develop that zero tolerance. So, just remember, and this is something that people can often make you forget, racism is not a debate, it's not a discussion. Um, if a patient is telling you, oh, I just want a white doctor, like, because, like, this, that, or whatever, you know, reasons that are given, just echo, it's often really um, powerful just to echo things as guidelines to say, you know, the NHS adopts zero tolerance policy to racism and discrimination, um, and we are holding up that policy. And you, as if, if you're a white student or a white professional, you being an active bystander can be such a powerful thing to the person of colour who can feel who can be made really vulnerable by this. Um, I once got told on placement why, like how are you studying medicine and you wear that on your head by a doctor. Like a doctor said that to me, and it was pretty traumatising. And they kept um, like you know back and forth yelling at me about it. It was really awful. And all I could, in that moment, I was trying to defend myself and I looked around and I saw a couple of white nurses who were clearly shocked by it, but they didn't do anything. And I think they weren't really sure how to, what to do. And if they had stepped in, I'm not like, you know, but I, I, they should have, they should have stepped in as active bystanders. So that's where, you know, if you're a white person, you're wondering like, how, what can I do to help? That's what you can do. You can step in with that zero tolerance. And if you're a person of color, just be empowered by that. Just know that, you know, trade unions and policy should be behind you and should be backing you. And also just like a kind of a quick amendment to say that as a person of colour, remember also that you have a role to be an ally to. So myself, especially with this movement, I've been conscious that I'm not black and there are specific issues that black people face in terms of anti-blackness. And I also have a role to be as well, like an active bystander. So remember all of those things and you can do so much, honestly. going to say i think as a sorry i was going to very quickly say as a clinician um senior clinician um a gp like if if any trainee or any junior member of staff does does say that and it's important for me to step in and similarly if you're a medical student then you know your junior doctor colleagues your registrars your consultants if you don't feel comfortable challenging the patient you should tell them and they should back you up without question they are ascribing skin color or the way you look to your competency and that is not appropriate in any shape way or form and i think what what i find really helps is 
this is being recorded. I I don't care. Um, <laughs> is just make them feel really stupid. I'm and just like repeat what they've said to them. Oh, so you so you would rather die than um be treated than by a black doctor. Like I think just like echo just 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 repeat what they've said. And I, I think when people literally hear the words they've used they realize how ridiculous it is and obviously definitely flag it up and report it. So um, since last year, I've um, been doing this thing where I have a folder on my laptop, laptop called complaints and I've just been, anything that happens, I literally just complain to the university. Like the head of HR knows me quite well now. She's tired of me, but it doesn't really matter. Like just like I've dedicated an hour of my week to complain basically. Um, but just keep on complaining because that way then they, they can never ignore you. Just keep on using like their own systems, I, I suppose in a way against them as well. Just keep on complaining. Like don't be afraid to um, complain. You're a student, you, have, you, have, you actually have quite a lot of protections. They, they can't actually really do much. Um, exactly. Um, sorry, I just wanted to really quickly add on something I'd forgotten as well. Um, definitely keep putting it on people's agenda um, by doing things like that, by complaining, by showing that you care, even if nothing gets done, you show that this is important. Um, and I was also going to say, um, just to bring up part of the conversation, not just about educating yourself and empowering yourself, but also on learning about specifically what to do um, next. So um, in terms of like learning how to, um, you know, increase in your curriculum and improve education about this stuff as well because what we're saying here medical schools should be teaching um it's i would really recommend like talking to the bay medical students at your um school and yourselves even as white medical students and forming some kind of group to change the curriculum at your medical school um if you want some more information on like best practice about how to do this like please please um email me and i can add you to our like working group where we focus specifically on direct actions to change the curriculum but the reason I want to always bring it back well it's not just the curriculum but the school but I want to bring it back to medical schools and medical education is because the stuff that we're saying here should be taught content and I want to help like empower students to do that at their medical schools as well. Um, so we're actually coming to near the end of the session but are there any burning questions? I think we can take one, one or two. I haven't seen any. Um, and also, um, if you, I think you all have already just drop your socials so that um, people can message you asking about questions because I think you've shared a lot of resources. There's been a lot of food for thought in this panel. Um, not seeing any questions coming up right now. But yes, thank you so much. We answered our own questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. So one thing that I think you you sent to us that you want to discuss what would the future of decolonizing healthcare. Um, yes. Would look like, and I mean that's a really interesting question because. Um, to sort of reimagine like, a kind of ideal scenario or kind of utopia versus what like what we can like actually achieve is is really difficult and you're faced with the decision like do i want to work on working within the pre-existing system or do we want to revolutionize so when we talk with other decolonizing groups like in other parts of the university they consider us to be quite conservative because we are working with the faculty and everything like that. And whereas our faculty sees us as quite like a radical group. Um, so there are definitely like th three areas that need to be worked on, like medical research. So what we kind of talked about with like the production of knowledge. So definitely as a student, look out for opportunities for you to get involved with research, um, particularly if there's like crossover with any kind of social sciences. So I think that's a really exciting area or an overlap of where I kind of natural sciences and social sciences can overlap. In terms of like medical education, um, we are really trying to put together a toolkit that we can roll out to the faculty and lecturers so that they themselves can start to critically analyze their own work and how they are actually teaching the medical students. Because 
we're not able to go through the whole curriculum and do that work for them and like, it has to come from each pupil individually and the last one is like on clinical practice and that's an area that like i i haven't i'm not qualified yet so i want to go into but um i definitely want to take these principles with me and especially like from, from my position i'm white i'm coming from like i'm going to be university educated and everything like that so it's extra important for me to learn about these things and learn from you guys um and everyone that i talk to to make sure that i'm not actually propagating this idea of like um like the systems of biomedicine that we've, we've been talking about and um just to like add to what tina's saying about learning so like my i guess my future of decolonizing healthcare it looks obviously less less paternalistic but also um just like recognition that other people have knowledge that's one of my pet peeves about medical students and doctors and stuff like we think we, we think we know everything when in actual fact we don't know everything um there are multiple knowledge holders and there are like multiple truths and just um understanding that if for example i'm interested in widen participation cool it's good that i'm interested in that but there are some people whose life's work is literally being an, an economy an economist working in that particular sector so my i guess my ideal future of healthcare would be a health system in which we recognize and appreciate everyone's specialisms everyone's knowledge regardless of whether it's you're you're a doctor a nurse a physiotherapist just genuine multidisciplinary work yeah exactly um and you recognize that multidisciplinary work you then begin to realize that science and medicine is not objective it's also subjective just as literature is just as history is so you can then begin to analyze the things you're being taught and question what you're being taught and question its legacy and in our case it's often racist legacy um but when you do that when you question just always as i've said multiple times action 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 you've, you've questioned you've discussed what are you going to do now and that can be something you do individually so you can then decide okay based on this conversation i'm going to go and read this book or read this resource um i'm going to um, maybe, you know, contact some BAME students and form a group or like email my lecturer or something like that. Um, it can be, yeah, what you do as a group. So you can form a group, um, you can um, lobby on this, generate some aims, etc. And then like, you know, what you do, what, and, and then it's about what institutions do, what do schools do, um, and keep putting that on their agenda. So like, just be really, really careful sometimes because there is so much performatism. There'll be, you know, a statement about like, we are, you know, our BAME students really matter to us or um, we are continuously discussing this and reviewing this um, but you just have to really cut through and think no what is actually being done what is the tangible change and put deadlines on that as well and I think that's what I'd see in an ideal world I would see I'm not going to say that it would be perfect and that everything would just be equal and decolonized and representative because that is very very hard just even as a person, you're always having to re-educate yourself and find flaws. But in an ideal world, I'd want to see commitments to these discussions. I'd want to see timelines on these and I'd want to see deadlines for actions. And I'd want to see BAME students and people of, and students of colour being compensated for the time that they give to this and the energy that they're putting in um, and people not to be shy for, um, you know, just being unafraid to exist in the space that they deserve. amazing and have you guys been reading the um the comments they're so lovely and i think a lot of aspiring students have been really inspired um by everything that you said today and the the comments just keep coming through i think there's a really sweet one which is as an aspiring student it means so much to know that there are people fighting for change and it's it's just so sweet and i'd like to say as well thank you so much for giving your valuable time especially on a saturday morning or afternoon now uh to come and talk about these important topics and um spread awareness of this um i think we're ending the panel now um but thank you so much again and thank you to everyone who tuned in thanks for having us take care thank you so much for having us thank, thank you so much it was an honor thank you